Hi hobby friends, let's build and paint a kitbashed chaos knight. Okay, so cards on the table, this video might be a bit self-indulgent. I'm currently working on a new Chaos Knights army, which you might have seen if you follow me on the old socials, and most recently I finished this big bad beastly boy. But I really want to share the whole process, and that means that we might get a little sprawling. If you're only interested in one bit though, take a look at the timestamps in the description and you can jump straight to that. And for those of you that want to see the whole lot, I've tried to keep things as chronological as possible. Minimal temporal warp shenanigans going on here. Okay, let's get going. Phase one is always thinking, but that doesn't make for great footage, so let's watch me drill tiny holes in the leg joints instead. I'm not a great planner for this kind of stuff, and I think the most interesting kit bashes probably happen when you let go and just see what the bits box gods yield, but I did go in knowing I wanted something a little more dynamic, a little more epic than the standard pose. And if the last five to ten years of GW sculpts have taught us anything, it's that you make things more dynamic by putting one of their feet up on something. Maybe a rock, maybe something bigger. For chonky lads like this desecrator, you are going to have a lot easier time reposing the legs if you pre-drill lots of little holes around the joints before you snip it off the sprue. The more holes you can squeeze on the better, kind of like making a perforated tear here line. With enough holes you should be able to snap the pieces apart, or get them apart with minimal trimming at least. Then it's just a case of cleaning up the cuts first with a hobby knife and then with some sandpaper or sanding sticks, and with that done we can glue all our leg halves together. Maybe not a bad idea to mark up which bits go with which as well, just in case. Feet next, and I should note that since this is my first time building any Chaos Knight, I am constantly going back to the instructions to get a sense of how things are supposed to go together. Knowing at least the baseline gives me a good sense of what I can pre-build versus what needs modification before I put it together. First chance to have a real play now, hunting about for appropriate bits of scenery for my big boy to interact with on his base. Yeah, I am pretty sure a regular old tactical rock won't do for this leviathan. Before we make anything permanent-ish with glue though, we need to put some more bits together. My minimal kit bashing experience tells me that basically, and rather frustratingly, you need almost all the major sections partially built to get the pose right. There are a million subtle cues in the angles of the pelvis and shoulders that make a mini look properly grounded or dynamic or whatever it is you're going for, and there are certain hard limits set by the shapes of all the joints that will need to be explored before you commit, lest you end up with an off-kilter wobbler. It can get pretty hectic on the table at this point, with bits flying about everywhere and a million things to try and hold in place while you check your pose. But one thing that can really help is this stuff, museum putty. Blue tack will work too, but if you want a slightly stickier, firmer hold, museum putty is your best bet. Right, that looks fine, but it'd look a lot better if we were stomping on a loyalist lapdog, wouldn't it? Out with the saw, and on with the desecration of a walking armoured grave. Still not quite ready for glue just yet though, as I said everything has an effect on the pose, and that everything includes the head. This was definitely one of those serendipitous kit bashing moments where I was chucking around some bits from the kit and playing with ideas, and then I turned around and I remembered that I still had an intact Tyranid half of the Leviathan box, and in there was one of the coolest mouths in all of 40k. More sawing, snipping, and a little alignment of a faceplate from the knight, and things are shaping up pretty nicely. I opened up the back of the neck panel here to get a truly cavernous maw for our chap, and with that roughed in it was time to call in the big guns. It was time to deploy my husband. Although I often get nudges and suggestions from my dear with regards to paint jobs, suggestions that I usually ignore and which always end up being correct, this is the first mini project that I've ever gotten out of the seat and handed the toy soldier over to him. 
but then he did graduate from the sculpture department of Japan's most prestigious art school, so, you know, I'm more than happy to collaborate on this one. Most excellent husband went about constructing an upper jaw and painstakingly snipping tyranid spikes to set individually into the mouth to create that wicked upper fang section. And when that superb work was done, messy old me with a finger covered in milliput came back to the table to work out some more very minor but important details. Namely, in this case, curling the toes over the dread corpse to get a real sense of connection and weight behind that foot. A little green stuff to recreate the folded rubber look and we are finally ready to start setting these feet in place. The arms were built as per the instructions in this case, except for the addition of a little mid-battle snack to the claw hand, and with some escaping tentacles coming out the main hatch, the vast majority of the build is done. One last flourish that won't come back into play until the very, very end, some wavy flags made from brass ribbon and some rods. Nothing special here, just snip them into shape. I used some tin snips, but thinner gauges can be cut with robust kitchen scissors, I'm told, and then bend and shape to your heart's content. And with that, it is now time to paint. Nothing like a nice black prime to really get a sense of how your kit bash really looks. All the mixture of materials can variously hide and highlight issues with a build, but the all-encompassing black of a good prime will let you know what you're really dealing with. I don't like working in sub-assemblies, but this is definitely one model I'm happy to make an exception of. Although I painted both my little war dogs as one complete build, the ergonomics of handling a chunky boy like this while roughing him up with a dry brush does not sound appealing at all, so let's leave him in bits for now. Layer 1 of the dark metallic dry brush is swiftly followed up with layer 2 of a lighter metallic. I'm using Scale 75's Fantastic Metallics here. When that's done, I temporarily tacked all the undercarriage bits together and added a little colour shading by way of Liquitex's muted grey ink through the airbrush. A very light cover of raw sienna ink from the opposite angle completes the warm, cool contrast. I highly recommend experimenting a bit with this sort of gentle metallic coloration. It can be a quick way to get a little dynamic variation on large areas of metal like this. And here's another way, particularly apt for denizens and war machines of the grimdark 41st millennium. Some rust smears, achieved nice and quick with splodges of oil paint. Just dot on some appropriately browny orange paints and use a clean brush to smoosh it down, and you'll have some lovely rust streaks. One important thing I've noticed, always go down relative to whatever pose the mini will be in. Even if the arm is out at an angle it wouldn't normally be at, and you're sure it would make more sense for the streak to run at an angle more probable when the arm is in a rest position, don't do that. Streak down towards the base. It'll always look better every time. No escaping the arduous job of blacking in the cables and the like now. Put on some good music and switch off while you find all the stray and vulnerable looking exposed tubing and wires. With that done, let's reward ourselves by finally gluing the body onto the legs. Where possible for big bits like this, I like to use a double whammy of glue. A layer of plastic glue will give us that melted plastic lock, but a little spot of super glue blasted with some activator will hold it in place while the plastic glue does its work. I even blobbed on some sprue goo on this one just to be extra safe. Arms went on at this point too. Now let's get to work on those armour panels. Our base layer here is my beloved Molotov Petrol, a greeny, desaturated blue that makes everything a little moodier, and that is followed up with Largo Pastel from the same range. The idea here, and throughout the panel painting process, is to build up layer after layer of colour and value to give a really complex, aged look. As such, even though our final target is an off-white blue-grey colour, we still want at least a little of that darkest blue peeking in around the edges and the darkest corners. I use exactly the same paints to pre-shade all of the fleshy bits as well, by the way. 
Cool grey from Molitor next, building up those highlights and the general tonal complexity, and then a final pass with pure titanium white ink to push us up into that off-white that I'm after. You can get quick textural splatter effects, by the way, by pulling back on your airbrush trigger without pressing down, and then releasing it, and then pressing down to blast some air. Time to trim. Decayed iron is what we're after here, and so we start with a strong dark brown base. Another opportunity to dethink yourself and get lost in some colouring in. That stage is followed up with some deliciously scabby, dirty down rust effect. As the instructions inform us, this stuff works best when the paint and the surface are a little warm. So have your hairdryer at the ready and keep your pot of rust in a little bain-marie of hot water. And that is far enough along with the panels to warrant some more gluing. Hooray! Here's something I definitely meant to do before the trim, those big, worn and rotted areas on the pauldrons. Should be pretty obvious that it's just some sponging with browns and oranges, I think. I don't want to get too crazy here, though, just some extra interest in a couple of key places. Time now for scale modelers and grimdark enthusiasts' worst kept secret, oil filters. This is a truly magical technique. You take some appropriate oil paint colours, dot and splodge them in vaguely the right place, then smoosh and blend them with a big, soft, clean and dry brush. And hey presto, you get gorgeous, rich shading for next to no work. You can be fairly bold in your colour choices here, though having said that I am using a rather muted palette of burnt umber and some Prussian blue mixed together to a greeny chromatic black. What I'm really after is added contrast. A few spots of blended titanium white will also help there as well. I have the paints on some scrap card to leach off a bit of the oil, by the way, which will help speed up the long drying time ever so slightly. While the oils are out, we can enhance our definition here and there with some panel lining too. Just thin down the oil paints with some white spirit, dab it into the corners and panel lines and watch the low surface tension mix do its magic. It can be cleaned off with gentle rubbing with a little white spirit damped brush or cotton bud if it goes somewhere you don't want it, and generally it is far and away the quickest way to re-establish details. If you find your mix is looking a little grainy, you need to add more paint, you've thinned it too much, and if you aren't seeing it chase up the channels and angled grooves nicely, maybe a touch more solvent will help you. Our Space Marine flavoured snack got a quick coat of Vallejo's Express colours to set as base colours, and then I fancied some, quote, proper painting. You know, the brushy, brushy kind. So I broke out the white and started sketching in some texture and light on the tentacles and fleshy bits. This underpainting, combined with the transparent layers coming soon and the final opaque work at the end, will all combine to give us a dense, lively, textured look to our chaos horrors here. Good chance to throw down some edge highlights and scratches as well. A little bone-coloured contrast paint, glazed and feathered in patches here and there, adds yet another layer of grime and interest to the panels, and then it's time to fix something. No, not the bit of the gun that I completely forgot about, but we probably should get that done too. No, I'm talking about the trim. Effect paints like this Dirty Down stuff are great, but they can leave me a bit cold in the end, mostly because they lack any kind of lighting information. And on all minis, but especially a big lad like this night, that lighting information is what's really going to sell your scale. So the Dirty Down makes a mighty fine base with lots of texture and good colours, but now it's time to get stippling with a soft round brush and some regular acrylics to put the highlights and shadows exactly where we want them. A little scratchy edge highlighting with some metallics and now the trim is really singing. Okay friends, we are getting there, just 
three major elements left, the first of which is the gnarly face bits. We've already done a lot of groundwork with the initial underpainting, both with the airbrush and the little bit of refinement we did with the regular brush, but now it's finally time to add a little colour. This is my go-to setup for nasty flesh now, after lots of playing around. Gilliman's Flesh makes for a nice general cover, Skeleton Horde yields some lovely yellowish highlights, Plague Bearer gives us lots of gross greeny bits, and some dibs and dabs of Volupus Pink bring back the blood where we want a little more of that stuff. This stage is all about washing in colours. Don't get too hung up on details, you're going for a general feel here. Let the paints blend naturally on the mini and just have some fun. Any mistakes can be cleaned up later. You can add some Flesh Terrors Red to that too, by the way, if you need some really bloody or fleshy bits. When that's all dry, we can go in with a palette of regular acrylics and lose ourselves for a minute in the joy of painting. The penultimate element is that cheeky little fire that's broken out under the good baron there. Yep, yeah, we're going to throw in some OSL into this video too, why not? Here's something that is really fundamental to OSL, but which I don't always see stressed too often. Paint mixes subtractively. Light mixes additively. That's colour theory speak for, if you add more paints, it'll get darker. If you add more light, it'll get lighter. In practical terms, all that means is, if we're going to add layers of transparent paint for a lighting effect, we need to bring up the whole value first as well. The easiest way to do this is with some white ink through the airbrush, starting at the fire itself and fading out pretty quickly from there. In the grand scheme of things, fires, candles and other flamey sources of light aren't really that strong, so the overall contribution to this scene would really be pretty small. We can, however, tweak it a little in the favour of the flame though, just for dramatic effect. Colour next, and a not too surprising combo of reds and yellows. Again, the more intense feeling yellow is focused in the middle, and it fades out to red at the outside. An orange fluorescent ink is a great way to add some more oomph and warmth to your OSL effect. Just as our general lighting is caught on edges more, and thence we edge highlight, so too with this little conflagration. We need to find the corners and edges facing the bonfire, and give them a little boost with brighter oranges and reds. The last bit for the lighting is the re-establishment of some cast shadows. You'll need to imagine an expanding ball emanating from your light source and keep an eye out for any obstructions to its passage. The shadows will fall behind those objects relative to the source, and we can fill them in with a simple pass of Payne's Grey ink in this case. There is a lot more we could do on this subject, but this chap isn't a display piece, so let's just move on to our final step, the flags. The prime for these is a can of primer filler designed for cars that I had lying around from a 3D printing experiment. It has finally found a proper use in my toolkit though, as my go-to primer, Molotow's All For One Black, didn't like sticking to the super smooth surface of the metal. So far, this is the only material that's beaten All For One though, so don't take this as evidence against the Molotow range. That yellowish base is built up to a creamy off-white via Molotow's Ochre Brown, Sahara Beige and Natural White, trying to keep a little structure in the fairly plain faces of the flag by leaving a little bit of the darker shades here and there. And when that's dry, I pull out some occult sigil references and a softish pencil, and I get to work laying out some very rough and ready designs. Payne's Grey ink and the steadiest hand I can muster fixes those designs, and right at the end when everything is done, I go to town with watered down brown and bone contrast paints, splodging and smudging some wear and tear here and there. 
This part of the paint job is a personal challenge. I know free hands is a big hole in my skill set, so I wanted to get loads of practice in with my basic brush control and design. It might mean some of the flags look a little bit weak in my opinion, but if I want to grow as a painter, I have to push myself somehow, right? And that, friends, was it. Cue up the turntable, it's time for the reveal. So what do you guys think? Did we do the Dark Gods proud? I didn't even touch on the cultists on the base there, but if you're interested, I can do a how-to on speed painting those when I get round to making that horde of demon proxy cultists I'm eyeing up. Let me know all your thoughts and ask any questions you have in the comments below. Hit the like and sub button if you liked and want to sub. Buy me a coffee with the super like if you super liked and check the description for more links and things if you fancy it. Thanks so much for watching and I will see you next time.